Welcome to another episode of Morgan's Madness. This is, of course, me, Morgan Barnes, from the Chompcast and Sword Chomp and this wonderful YouTube channel. I'm about to start recording this cool video, but I wanted you guys to meet my daughter, Maisie, because she is just so adorable. Usually she'll just sit in here while I record and uh, drink a nice bottle. What does the bottle look good to you? Oh, how does that look? Oh. She's got bottle eyes right now. Bottle eyes, she's so cute. Oh, say hi, Maisie. Say hi. Yeah. All right. Daddy's gonna make a, a cute YouTube video, okay? Okay? We're gonna talk about Game of Thrones and spiders having three ways. Sound cool? Yeah, okay. See you later. All right, so. A couple fun things to talk about today. I mean,. As with most of you, um, I watched Game of Thrones last night, and it was really intense. And, and I do have a lot of thoughts about it because, you know, as I talked about last week, the show is is walking this interesting line where it's the best of Game of Thrones, but it's also the worst of Game of Thrones. And, and here's the tricky thing that I noticed last night. Uh, let's start with the good. I don't like to come off as some, like nitpicker or you know somebody's trying to bring down the fun let's be honest most of us were gathered around our televisions last night watching it which I actually was laughing with my uh, girlfriend about because we get we get down on our couch at seven o'clock and we get ready to stream Game of Thrones as soon as it's ready but the act is very much like when you were younger and you'd have to wait for something to come on television but in this case with a lot of people we're streaming it on like HBO now and like other apps and you're like waiting for it to <laughs> like become available on the app as at an exact time it's a very like it's a very strange thing to me conceptually when, when you think about that because we're mimicking the behaviors of like when we were younger and you, everyone had like cable television, and you have to gather around and, and watch something at the same time. So, uh, I think that's pretty interesting, honestly, uh, just from like sort of an analytical standpoint. But, anyways, the best of that show right now is just incredible. You know, because uh, mostly because of the buildup. You know, we've been waiting so long for a lot of these things to happen. Um, Jon Snow and Daenerys to have this sort of dream relationship uh, connection that we had all kind of hoped for I guess um, personally I was dreaming for uh, da da Daenerys to fall in love with Jamie Lannister somehow that's what I wanted to I wanted Jamie Lannister to denounce his sister and I wanted him to somehow come in contact and fall in love with uh, Daenerys in some weird way and it doesn't appear as though that's going to happen but there was this incredible battle sequence where, you know, the the A team of, you know, Jon Snow and Beric Dondarrion and the Hound and Gendry, at least for a little while, have to venture out beyond the wall to find a uh, basically like a White Walker or an army of the dead um, patron <laughs> so they can bring him uh, back to Cersei and prove that there is indeed crazy shit happening beyond the wall it's not just you know tales of grumpkins and snarks as Tyrion likes to say so that's where they were at and then there was this incredible battle on ice and the you know Daenerys flies in on her dragons and sort of saves the day and you had this intense sequence where the Night King is like walking around with this like dead creepy I'm about to fuck shit up look in his eyes and he grabs this huge ice spear and as soon as he grabbed that ice spear and those dragons were flying around. I was looking at my girlfriend. I was like, fuck, no, fuck, no. Because I thought, I thought he was going to kill um, Daenerys. Or I didn't think he was going to kill Jon because Jon's already died once. So I just think it would be kind of dumb for Jon to die and then come back. I think Jon's actually safe from death for a while, which is a weird thing to say, you know, because he came back to life. But you never know. Maybe they'll bring him back again. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so when he picked up that ice spear, I was like, fuck. No, I was like so fr afraid that he was just going to spear Daenerys or something, even though that felt like it would have been weird too. But sure enough, he takes down one of her dragons and it's just gut wrenching. And that dragon just sinks into the ice. Poor Viserion. Um, and um, 
it was just a crazy intense moment. She's sitting there on her dragon, staring down at John, and John's just being like annoyingly heroic, and he's just continuing to fight these fucking, uh, you know, army of the dead. He's just continually killing them, and you're just like, get on the fucking dragon, John. It's just irritating. Um, anyways, they fly off. John survives, and the Night King is able to, of course, turn a dead dragon into an undead dragon for his own army of the dead. And that is pretty fucking cool that the Night King has a dragon, at least conceptually. I mean, I think a lot of people kind of knew this was coming only from the concept of the fact... I, so I, I've read the books twice, and the, the reason I thought something was going to happen with the dragons was because she had three of them. And in the books, they allude to some other things, like there's like a dragon horn that's being like moved around and stuff and I was thinking at some point in the books that someone was going to summon the dragons with this dragon horn but they've that has never happened in the show and I don't want to go too far too into that but there is a big dragon horn in the books that does seem to have some sort of significance um, and in the show it when she had three dragons, you just had to think somebody was going to get one. I thought for a while that maybe Bran, because he can like take over things as a warg, I thought that maybe Bran would go inside of a dragon at one point and, and take over it. Um, or something like that. I thought that would be a cool idea. I didn't know what the circumstances would be. But anyway, this is a really cool way to give the Night's King a chance. Because honestly, with her three dragons, they could have just burned them all fucking to the ground. It doesn't seem like it would have been much of a fight except for the fact that the Night King is a master javelin thrower as we've learned from all the memes going around he just uh, speared that thing out of the sky so and, and now it makes the Night King to me a little more interesting because at least conceptually the Night King hasn't really been that interesting to me now I know a lot of people like the White Walkers and the stuff that happens beyond the wall I've always just been more into the either the political side or the relationship side of most of the characters that are in Westeros and King's Landing and, of course, uh, Daenerys. And, like, I, I generally find all those stories more interesting than the whole undead army, Night King thing that's more traditional fantasy, I guess. Um, but I think giving him a dragon in that nature is pretty interesting um, as, as far as, you know, that's concerned. So... That that thickens that whole plot, and then you get to see a little bit of John and Daenerys uh, bonding. You know, they're having some moments where it looks you can see that connection is growing a little bit stronger, and I think that's that's important because you don't want to rush that if there's going to be a romance there. And then they're leading up to the finale next week, where there's some sort of the powwow to end all powwows. It looks like uh, in King's Landing, but you know there's going to be some twist. Because it never happens exactly like you think it's going to happen in Game of Thrones. But there's so many interesting storylines there. Uh, the Hound finally interacting with potentially his now undead brother, the Mountain. Of course, Cersei, Jaime, and Tyrion. You have, of course, Jon and Daenerys who presumably will be there. There's just going to be so much fucking tension. That's That finale has a lot of potential. Uh, and I'm really curious to see how that night goes down in the Game of Thrones world, as everyone else is. There are some things about the show that are just strange, frustrating, or nonsensical. And it I don't think that we necessarily have to forgive them. But it doesn't also you know, negate the things about the show that are great. And this could be perhaps because the books are not fully written yet. Or they've had to do things to sort of adapt such a complex storyline to television that there's some weird things like they decided to, to make this epic battle between like Jon Snow and his A-team uh, against the undead army on this like little island in the middle of a frozen lake um, which was a really cool idea but then there are some weird things like well why is you know why is um the hound throwing rocks uh, at the undead which is clearly going to give them a signal that you know, that the, the lake is still frozen and they can cross it. You know, it was just kind of weird. They, they felt like they needed a, they wanted like a very visual moment for the audience, the television audience, even though it doesn't really make sense. Uh, contextually, you don't think, no one on that island is going to do anything to upset or disturb the fact that those White Walkers are not moving toward them. So I, I thought little things like that. Um, there's some bigger things, uh, like Arya and Sansa. 
their, their confrontation feels really forced and strange. Like, I could see Littlefinger turning them against each other somehow because he's really intelligent, but the way they'd done it was weird. Like, a really old scroll, and Sansa lo uh, and Arya and Sansa love each other, and they're on the same side, and they've sort of fabricated this weird way to sort of, like, turn them against each other. And, like, there's this scene where Sansa's threat, or uh, Arya's threatening to cut off her sister's face, and it's just like... It just feels like too much to me sometimes there. Like, I hope that it has a nice resolution to it because it's just, it's hard to watch and it doesn't feel natural or as earned as I hoped it would. Of course, she sent Brent, Brienne back to get the, the powwow to end all powwows. So that could be interesting too as far as another uh, storyline goes there. But yeah, there's just, there's a lot of things that are kind of bugging me on that front um, that represent sort of these sort of silly plot holes or ideas in the show that are just frustrating. They're just they're just frustrating. Like, do you really need to almost kill Jon Snow again to have him fall in that frozen lake to get that point across? You know, like, we know he's not going to die. It's just, I don't know. There's, there's, there's just things that they do that feel very television-y, more so than before. Like, the reason I was always able to recommend Game of Thrones to people wholeheartedly is because it was really intelligent television like the way characters were acting felt natural like the plot lines and plot twists that occurred didn't feel contrived just for television you know there wasn't a lot that would happen that someone couldn't be like why is this happening and I could easily say well it's because of this this and this I feel like this particular season has the most like sort of rushed or frustrating or like head scratching things a lot of people like some of the little stuff doesn't bother me like like a lot of people were joking where did the Army of the Undead get those massive chains to pull the dragon out of the ice. Believe it or not, that stuff doesn't interest me as an, um, or bother me in, uh, as much. For example, in the book, if there was some sort of epic chapter where George explained, <laughs> he could write a whole chapter of someone having a conversation while these uh, they were watching this Army of the Undead drag these giant chains toward a frozen lake, and you'd be like, why are they doing this? What's going on? Until, of course, they pull up the dragon like that's something you could pull off in the books um but that sort of stuff is not as bothersome to me because it's like well i mean they're a giant army they could have giant chains you know it's they could send some dead people underwater like that's not as big of a deal to me as some of the other things and i've just this season has been really interesting because it is the most emotionally intense i have felt like i tweeted out that it felt to me, episode four, I believe, and this episode last night, six, had two of the most intense scenes I've ever seen involving a spear and a dragon. <laughs> of course, in episode four, where Jamie Lannister came charging uh, uh, Daenerys on her dragon, and then, or she was on the ground, but uh, nursing her dragon, and then in this season, um, or this episode, whoosh, the Night King threw the spear, and uh, the dragon went down. So again, spears and dragons is something they are just all about. And a really cool uh, scene involving a polar, a polar bear from the undead. You know, that was really cool, an undead polar bear. Uh, Beric Dondarrion is a character I always love from the books a lot. So I'm glad to see he's getting some screen time and some love. Um, the man who just always lights up his fire sword. Which, you know, <laughs> is... I, his, his whole plot line in the book and in the show has always been interesting to me because he's... He's dealing with a lot of like deeper metaphorical issues that the book is touching on, but he's dealing with them on a surface level. Like he talks a lot about like his little speeches about life and death and like, you know, uh, I, we're always fighting death, so we just kind of keep fighting it. Uh, and he's sort of a symbol for a lot of things to me metaphorically when I re read the books about just sort of the struggle of life. And he doesn't even know exactly what he's going up against. He just knows that he's always fighting against death. And he's fighting for this greater good. And he feels like he is chosen. And you're starting to see that as well. This, these people that have been sort of assembled together by circumstance and fate. Or the Red God, if you believe it. It seems like the Red God is the closest we have to something very real in our world. Much like um, the Fire and Ice, of course, with the, the Night King and that whole thing. The, the Red God seems to be very believable. As, as a lot of people believe a lot of the gods in the world, like the gods of the Seven, are sort of the traditional... Uh, religions are represented in that but the red god you know you had the the woman who had when Melisandre had the um, demon be birthed out of her vagina and 
that was a very real thing that happened <laughs> from very real power that she somehow obtained. And of course, you have Beric Dondarrion being brought back to life so many times, and now he's serving this greater good. So there's definitely something to the Red God that seems powerful. And there's some theories about Jon Snow perhaps being this like chosen prince um, of the Red God as well that I won't get into right now. But there's there's a lot there that's that's really interesting to me. And I've I loved Beric Dondarrion in the books when he would travel around and he fought the Hound, and you know pretty much was fucking the Hound up until his his shit broke <laughs> and then the hound fucked him up so that's the way it goes i guess but you know he's just a badass he's got his eye patch and his flaming sword i have theorized so in the books yurion Greyjoy is a character that we've seen a couple times he was the one who captured um theon's sister and so he was a, a character who in the books was a little more interesting he had a little more depth he had sort of sailed the world he was always drinking this weird um, juice that the, the, the mages would drink, like they'll leave their lips all black and blue and stuff. And he was sort of like a, a trippy, he was a trippy cat, if that's a weird way of describing someone. He's seen the world and he's had some darkness there and he's into some weird shit. Um, and he had an eye patch in the books, but in the TV show, he just um, is represented with uh, in more basic terms. And I think that the reason they didn't give him an eye patch in the TV show is could. Beric Dondarrion, the man with the flaming sword, already has an eye patch. So they don't want too many eye patches going around. <laughs> they have an eye patch uh, quotient at the meet, so our quota. And uh, the eye patch quota has been met. So there are so many cool, fun things to talk about with Game of Thrones now that I do love. And the intensity is just through the roof. Um, but those little things are frustrating me. At this point, I just have to come to accept it. Well, they have to finish up the show, and they've sort of walked themselves into these things that they have to do for television. So I'm going to have to accept the good with the bad. As there's more bads now, but the goods are also really fucking high. So uh, it's interesting. I, I, I can't think of anything I've ever been more curious about from an entertainment perspective every week to see what happens. No movie, no nothing, except the books, of course. Um, but George R. R. Martin takes... 7,000 years to finish a book, so um, I will say this. I cannot wait to read the books when he finishes them just to see what compares and just how much more is sort of described and what's going on there and how, if that scene that he wrote is very similar in the books, let's say where Daenerys has to come in and save Jon Snow and company, like how he writes that, you know, to see also write it as a spear takes down the dragon, like... We don't really know the exact nature of the conversations George R. R. Martin is having with the writers. We know that they know the ending and they know important things, but like to the outsiders, we don't know how much detail he's given them. George R. R. Martin could sit in that room and just go, look, um, I can tell you that a, the Night King's going to kill a dragon, but I'm not going to tell you how. That's up to you guys. So he might give him some leeway in that regard, which is both interesting and, you know, perplexing if that's how they choose to do things when they had the freedom and then sometimes the freedom is great right like i thought one of the things they changed for the show that was awesome was when brienne and the hound fought it was really cool it was an incredibly well choreographed fight scene just everything about it was beautiful and perfect and brienne kicks the hound's ass and it just felt like a perfect ending to that storyline so not everything they have done has been you know, frustrating or bad or disappointing, but definitely in this season, for sure. And that could just be because they don't have as much book um, to pull from as far as information goes. Uh, but still fascinating as fuck, I'll tell you that. Um, the second thing I was going to talk about, this is kind of weird and unrelated, so today's been kind of a weird day. Uh, everyone's excited about the clips, but that's not really, to be honest with you, just not that interesting, interesting to me. There's an eclipse going on right now, and I'm in here making this video. My daughter, as I showed you earlier, is sleeping <laughs> right, right next to me, drinking her bottle happily. Um, and I was kind of thinking of other things to talk about. I I found this weird story for the Chomp cast and Sword Chomp that I was going to read. Uh, and I'll break it down. I'm going to include the article so you can get all the details. The article will be in the description if you want to learn more about it. I've kind of got to this thing that I've been doing for the, the Chomp cast and uh, the Sword Chomp Instagram page where I've been having fun just finding these really fascinating um, biological or uh, animal related articles 
uh, and just talking about them in regards to like why they're interesting to me or just like th why they caught my eye. And this article was about basically spiders having three ways. And the reason it's interesting is because it's like a survival mechanic that they are using. And again, I'm going to have the, a link in the description below. Um, it's from Newsweek, and the tagline is "Freaky spiders engage in threesomes to avoid being cannibalized." So, uh, so basically, what it says is that these spiders. Um, so, if you don't know this, there's a lot of species of spiders that do cannibalize themselves, or the ma the males, in many cases, um, get eaten or killed by the females uh, during mating. And the reason this is interesting is because the male species are adapting in ways to help them survive. But in the context of, I think, maybe just the sexuality of it is interesting to me. Now, granted, I don't like to compare, you know, spiders having sex to um, human beings having sex on a one-to-one -one ratio. I mean, we're not spiders. We don't know the exact nature of even what having sex feels like as a spider. Um, and that's, that's okay. I still think it's an interesting thing to talk about uh, in this case. So... But basically, a couple interesting quotes that I found that I wanted to read. I don't like to just straight read too much on here, but this is more of a long-form YouTube video if you're going to watch this anyway. Um, the odd behavior may be a result of the difficult task facing the males of this species, the dotted wolf spider and its relatives. They must woo and mate with a member of the opposite sex that's often intent on cannibalizing them. This leads to interesting behavioral adaptations. And these threesomes appear to benefit the second male, or perhaps both males, by making it less likely they will be eaten, as the female is doubly distracted and subdued <laughs> by that double spider dick. Uh, the behavior also allows the second male to avoid courtship and still potentially pass on his genes. So that second male, really just flying in there, passing on his genes, uh, he just, he's just lazy. You know? Well, he even says right here, it's easier for a lazy male. Normally a female must access and accept the male, but not in this case, he adds. Which I wonder if there's two males involved, because when this guy first observed this happening, he thought for sure that the when the second male ran in to join, it was going to kill it. Um, but that didn't happen. And I'm wondering if they have developed some sort of communication, the spiders between each other, like the two males, because they're aware of each other. Like, as some sort of... a uh, adaptative thing like maybe I don't like to throw these things out there maybe they're spider friends maybe there's some sort of connection between these two male spiders and they're like look um, we have a better chance of surviving with each other I will initiate this mating pattern and then you you jump in and it's just interesting to me because basically it's like it's more distracting for her because she's got spiders all over her it's this frenetic um, spider sexual experience and that, like you said, she's more distracted and more subdued, and it increases the chances of the male spider or spiders surviving exponentially, which is really, it's it's not just like, oh, spiders are having three ways. It's like they're doing this as a, as a better way to survive, which is just fascinating to me. Um, it says, they had this quote from Ann uh, Ripstra, a zoology professor at Miami University of Ohio, who wasn't involved in the research. Um, says she finds it very surprising since normally males fight over females and females attack unwanted males. Uh, so she thinks that maybe the arrangement also could have benefits for the female as well. There's some evidence from other spider species that they can sort of sort sperm. Perhaps this strategy gives the female more diversity. So they're thinking like maybe it, you know, she's has a little more options. You know what I mean? Like this, this get, she's like, well, you know, I have more sperm here to choose from that we might be able to sort out. Um, which is mysterious and interesting. Um, so there could be benefits for her as well. A lot of this is mysterious, which is, I think, why it's fun to talk about. If we knew the answers, I think that decreases some of the things that make it interesting. Or to me, like the speculation is always what's what's fascinating. Um, and so this guy found some, and he had, like witnessed the whole thing. He said um, some of the mating rituals he watched were like. Um, uh, 45 minutes long, one was like an hour, one was like four hours long. So, I mean, that one must have been going really, really well. Um, and yeah, the, the two males don't fight, which is interesting. So, another quote here, it says, uh, they didn't fight as expected. The males actually took turns, which is made possible by the female spider's anatomy. So, this is interesting. Females have two spermatheca, 
which translates to sperm house. So she got two houses of sperm in there. Reproductive organs that are penetrated by a male's pedal palps. If I pronounce that wrong, I'm sorry. Basically, they are the male's penises, so to speak, are hairy leg-like appendages near the mouth that store sperm. In each threesome, the males could take turns putting the pedal palp into the female's spermatheca. One grouping lasted nearly 45 minutes after discovery and another took more than four hours. So that was what I mentioned before. So that's interesting because they they could take turns putting um, their spider penises into the female because of just how she's designed. Um, almost weirdly enough, you know, sort of a, this three-way is adapting to the situation, but it fits the species really well, which is another sort of strange thing about this story. Um, and then, of course, they were laughing. There's all sorts of quotes about they don't know exactly how they're experiencing sex and all that kind of stuff. But it's an interesting, it's a really interesting article. And it just got me thinking about, like, of all the ways they're adapting. First of all, the species that murder during sex are interesting to me because, like, as humans, sex is such a powerful thing in our world. Like, sex rules the media. Sex controls so much of our lives and um, the way we think. And yet there's these species out there that we study that, you know, they they literally deal with like murder and death and um, whenever they whenever they go to mate and then there's situations where they literally have to adapt to, like they were talking about how the spider sometimes will bring them food um, or even look for immature females because they are not quite as, and that's kind of, that's kind of crossing the line creepy in the spider world too if you think about it, if you were to put it in like a human context because they look for slightly Im immature females because they haven't developed um, the, the power enough, uh, powerful enough fangs to kill them. So they try to mate with more immature female species as a way to survive. And that's got to be quite a dance for, I mean, I don't know if they're, they're obviously, it's primal, it's within them to try and mate, we would presume, of course, for their species. And how they feel about it, we don't know particularly. Is it like a strong lust? Is it more like a like, oh shit, I have to do this because I know my body's telling me to do it and I'm going to go insane if I don't. Like, I'm literally going to go insane, but when I do this, I know I have a chance of dying, which is an insane prospect if you think about it. Like, out in the real world, as human beings, if we were to know that whenever we were going to have a sexual interaction with someone, there was a chance that we would be fucking murdered. <laughs> that would just, it's such an interesting thing to think about. Like, there's a chance you could die when you go to have sex. Like, I mean, it just changes up the bar life. You're just sitting over like, man. Me and this girl are getting along really well, and she's beautiful, and I think we're going to hit it off tonight, and oh, but I don't know, man. She she might kill me. <laughs> like, it's just it's it's just weird. It's just weird, but really interesting. So, um, yeah, I'll put the link in the description if you want to read about it. That was an article that caught my eye that I'll probably put on the Sword Chomp Instagram. Among other things, just kind of wrapping up. Uh, the beginning of my week, I've been playing a lot more No Man's Sky. Nothing new really to report on. I did get my good friend and podcast host Fish more into the game, and he's starting to enjoy it since the 1.3 update. Um, and I'm very upset with him because he found an incredible starship right at the beginning of his storyline by pure, random, beautiful chance. Um, and we'll talk about more about that on the podcast as well. But yeah, it should be a fun week. I'll try to get some other videos up. I'm experimenting with the idea of doing some let's plays but my let's plays will be more in the vein of like something really stupid or silly or therapeutic like maybe it's like something that helps me relax to relieve anxiety at the end of a long day i'm not sure yet um but those are the main things that have been going through my head this morning this week also got a really cool new shirt rocking the pikachu so that's one fun thing about being able to do these youtube videos now as a therapeutic venting for me and i can jazz up this room a little bit and i get to I have a reason to go buy cool shirts that I never had before um, <laughs> other than just wearing them. So, but yeah, so if you're also, if you're discovering these videos for the first time, um, I include links in the description for my podcast. It is the Chompcast I do with uh, three of my best friends and we talk about video games and life and all sorts of crazy things. And um, we have, we're doing all sorts of cool guest hosts lately. Uh, among other things, we just did a Pokemon show very recently that was incredible. So check that out please support us subscribe share you know we the biggest thing i want to do is really build that community and that's why i like to have people who support us on the show because i i want the community to be like literally involved 
in the podcast if possible. You know, I'm inspired by a lot of people out there. I know, like, kind of funny. They do a great job of incorporating people into their podcast. But they're so big, you have to pay a lot of money uh, on their Patreon support system to get on the show if you want to. But I, I don't want it to be like that with us. You know what I mean? We might do contests and giveaways or... Um, polls and things like that and, and pick people at random or just people who are really passionate about being on the show but um, having people come on and read their topics and do cool things like that is just it's been incredible so um, you know help us grow the community we love to have you on board again I'm having fun with these channels I know they're a little different than the YouTube channel where people do all sorts of fast edits and these videos are probably 15 to 20 minutes long of me just talking and rambling but for the people that find them interesting, thank you for checking them out. It's therapeutic for me as well as just kind of uh, having a fun discussion. So um, thanks for watching the newest episode of Morgan's Madness. And um, we'll have more cool stuff to come.